Thank you for taking time on your Saturday to attend this presentation. If you didn't know, our October is American Archives Month. So um, archives across the country participate um, doing special events, exhibits, um, just showing off the collections they hold and um, promoting their themselves the people because we do exist for people to use us so it's a great way to kind of get a feel for um, different repositories across the country and locally so um like i said my i am a senior records consultant at the puget sound branch archives um jessica's reference archivist here um today we're gonna go over the mission of the archives as a whole, if you're not familiar with that. Um, we're going to go over why we hold the records that we do and why it's important that we do that. Um, we're gonna give a brief overview of how to use the archives um, for your research and other needs. Um, and we're gonna go over the different records that we hold at the Puget Sound branch at the archives. So, the term archive is kind of a, um, a fuzzy one. It's used in a lot of different ways. I think a lot of people are familiar with it in the tech world sense. When you maybe archive an email, it means to store it away out of sight. You might think of old dusty tomes hidden away in a cave somewhere or a basement out of sight, out of mind. Um, you might think it's just a, a collection of old things or uh, specimens, books, newspapers, papers, things like that. Um, and while a lot of institutions do kind of blur the lines between library archives and museums, um, the basic differences are libraries are dedicated to uh, preserving and provi providing access to published materials. So books, newspapers, periodicals, um, things that are published and likely in duplicate form. Museums are primarily focused on preserving objects like relics, art, natural specimens. And then archives are primarily focused on preserving and providing access to unique records created by individuals, uh, government entities, companies, the basically the original records created by an entity like correspondence, uh, planning, governance, documentation, maybe financial documentation, records documenting construction of buildings and infrastructure, things like that. In school, you might refer to these as primary sources. So it's straight from the horse's mouth, can't be found anywhere else. Documentation that is crucial to understanding an uh, individual or an entity. So at the Washington State Archives, our mission is to collect and provide access to public records created by all levels of Washington State government. So from the governor's office, Supreme Court, legislature, state agencies like Department of Transportation, Department of Corrections, Department of Ecology, down to the local level. So county level government, cities, towns, school districts, public utility districts, all levels of Washington state government. And we hold thousands of records from the territorial period in the 1850s all the way up to today. So why do we do this? And why is it important? It's not just because old things are cool, although we do have a lot of cool records. The, well, the main reason that we collect government records is because these records belong to you and me. They belong to the citizens of Washington because the government is working for us. Um, these records are considered public property under the law. This is because they help us claim our rights as citizens. They document our marriages, our property transactions, our lawsuits, our licenses. 
things that allow us to uh, have rights as citizens. They also enable us to hold our government accountable. They serve as evidence of our government government's actions and that we can review. And finally, they provide a unique history of our state that can't be found anywhere else. Um, just personally, as a reference our archivist, I people need these records for so many reasons, you know, from uh, finding out what has been what activities or what uh, structures have been on a site for environmental cleanup purposes, providing proof of marriage and divorce, uh, looking up legislative history, uh, property history, governing officials decisions. Uh, just so many, it's so important for people to have access to these records. Um, so that's what really drives us to preserve and provide access to these important, this important documentation of our state. Um, it's also important to note that public records exist in any format. I know a lot of people, when they think of archives or records, they think primarily of paper. And while we do hold a lot of paper, um, it's important to note that records are information that has been captured in a format that allows it to be reviewed at a later date. So that includes electronic records, photographs, audio, databases, anything that um, was created by government employees as part of their work um, in the transaction of public business is considered a public record. Um, part of my job here at the archives is to help develop retention schedules that lay out um, what documentation of different government activities needs to be kept, how long to keep it, what to do when that time period is over. About 1 to 3% of all records created by governments are um, considered to be archival. So a small percentage of records we've determined need to be preserved forever. And 99% of those records are open for public consumption and access. So that is why it's that's why we our mission is to provide free centralized access to these important records. Um, and that was not always the case um, in the US at least the thought that governments should be preserving their records for future generations to uh, research and go over was not really a an action that lawmakers and government started taking into account until the late 1800s. Um, I don't know if any of you are a genealogist, but you might know that the entire 1890 census was destroyed in a fire. Uh, if you ever tried to do genealogy and there's that big gap there, it's because uh, there wasn't proper preservation taken into account with those records and now they're gone forever. Um, it wasn't even until 1978 that presidential records became uh, legally public records that needed to be kept. Um, before that, it was kind of up to the president to decide where their records went after their term. Um, so some ended up in private collections, some ended up at universities, and even some presidents ordered their papers to be destroyed after they died. It just wasn't considered a uh, public property that people had the right to examine. Um, at the state, at the Washington state level, um, you can see you know, are the records of our first territorial governor, Isaac Stevens. Um, in the records we hold in Olympia, it's just a couple of tiny boxes. Um, while also some of his records ended up at his alma mater, Yale, some of them ended up at University of Washington. It was, they were just spread around because there was no regulation stating that these records needed to come to a centralized place and be kept. Um, and Washington State became a territory in 1853, became a state in 1889, but it wasn't until 1909 that we even established a public archives commission, kind of working to address um, preserving records of our state government. Um, 
And even then, there, there was no centralized location for these records for decades. Uh, there were very hazy guidelines about whether you whether agencies had to transfer their records, what records to transfer. Um, so some agencies ended up uh, transferring every piece of paper they ever created, even things that were just really not worth the preservation cost. And, and then some agencies transferred nothing. And I'm sure that many records were lost during this time. And there's also kind of a lack of staff or um, professional leadership in the archives to help provide access and make decisions about what needed to be kept. So the state archives, as we know it now, um, really didn't get started until 1957. So that that is even a further amount of time where there was kind of hazy, vague guidelines about what needed to be kept and how to provide access. But in 1957, they revamped the laws regarding preservation and destruction of public records. We had our first trained archivist at the helm of the archives. Um, it started establishing better guidelines about what needed to be kept, what needed to be come to come to the archives. Um, and we started building these centralized locations that really focused on both pre preserving and providing access to the people. So that's where we are today. Um, we are a public trust uh, institution dedicated to preserving the records created by state and local governments of Washington for the benefit of the people. Uh, we are a section of the Secretary of State's office. Um, and yeah, let me go over the different branches that we have. Um, so the records that are going to be found at the different branches throughout the state are going to depend on the level of government that is close by and what the level of governments the branch serves. So our main branch in Olympia um, holds the records of state level agencies. So Governor's Office, Department of Corrections, Department of Ecology, Legislative History, things like that. Um, our Olympia branch also holds the records of local governments uh, um, in the nine Southwest Washington counties. Um, so counties, cities, towns, special districts, things like that in the Southwest Washington counties, you're gonna find that at our Olympia branch. Um, the Bellevue branch or the Puget Sound Regional branch where Jessica and I work um, covers local government records from King, Pierce, and Kitsap counties. Uh, we're in Bellevue on Bellevue College's campus. We have a Northwest branch in Bellingham on Western's campus that covers local government records from the Northwest Washington counties. Our central regional branch in Ellensburg is on Central Washington University's campus um, and covers the local government records of the central Washington counties and cities. And then we have our eastern branch in Cheney um, that also holds our digital archives. They uh, gather records from the eastern Washington local government agencies. Um, like I said, also the in Cheney is also the site of our uh, state digital archives placed over there as a countermeasure to any potential um, natural disasters that might happen on the west side of the mountains. So they figured the eastern that Cheney was a good place for that. So you many of you might be familiar with our digital archives. Um, the outward facing portal that has records that are searchable and um, images of records that are accessible to the public, kind of self service. Um, our, it's digitalarchives.wa.gov. There's a lot of great information on there that we're adding new records all the time. Um, we also have a volunteer program called Scribe, which um, where people can volunteer to help transcribe these records and make them searchable by other people. Um, it's a, just a volunteer program. You can donate as much as much time or as little time as you want. So 
look into that if you're interested. It's we really rely on our scribe volunteers to help make these online records accessible to people. Um, and then there's also a back uh, non public facing side to the digital archives where we have many other digital records that agencies transfer to us um, that we may in the future work to make publicly accessible, but just be aware that we do preserve digital records and can make those available to you. Um, just not self service, like the front facing side. Um, the finding the records that you or information that you want does require a little familiarity with the different responsibilities of different types of government records that we um, collect. So it's not like a library where you're, you, I mean, it takes a little bit more um, thought than just going to a library and checking out a book about prohibition, say. You have to kind of think about, well, what records would capture what I'm looking for about prohibition, for example. So if you were interested in how the governor's office dealt with it, you might want to research at our Olympia branch and the governor's records from the time, um, see how different state agencies uh, develop policies about it, maybe uh, liquor control board records, things like that. Um, if you were look interested in more of a, the local approach, like how cities and towns dealt with uh, prohibition, you might want to take a trip to one of the regional branches and check out the uh, local government records we have. Um, so, again, the kind of knowing the difference between what's going to be held at the state level, what's going to be held at the local level, um, at the local level and state level, we might have uh, commission board minutes, um, local level, we're going to have ordinance resolutions. We're going to have um, articles of incorporation, both for when a city or town is formed at, and those were filed at the state level. Also, um, any, like corporations, like businesses, if they filed with the state, um, that's a popular history. Uh, topic of tracing the history of different corporations, their different names over time, who were on their boards of directors, things like that. Um, another property, uh, another popular records group that we get a lot of research for is property records. Um, and Jessica's going to go into a little bit of this sooner, but like I like with the library analogy, we're not going to have a neat little file on your house per se. Um, you're going to be looking at records of your property or a property you're interested in through the eyes of how the government would have captured information about that property. So we've got maybe assessor records assessing how much property is worth throughout the years, uh, tax rolls showing what taxes were paid on a property, um, things like that. Uh, we also have some vital records, birth, death, marriage, uh, divorce. Again, uh, the time period is going to change what's available where. So, for example, um, prior to so 1907 and later, birth and death, death records were recorded at the state level. Prior to 1907, when that law was passed, any sort of birth or death records were recorded at the local level if they were recorded at all, because it wasn't required. So it just, you, you get to know the little ins and outs of the laws over the time periods. Um, you can always contact us if you have any questions about uh, where to find the records you're looking for, because it can get, again, a little uh, confusing throughout the years. Um, again, we also have uh, legal records. So at the state level, level we'll have, um, we have a big collection of records of people who went to the state penitentiary, state reformatory in the years, the 1800s up to the 1950s. And we have um, slightly less records after that, but we do still have that. We have court case records um, and probate case files, uh, naturalization records, things like that. Um, it is important to note that what we hold does vary um, by location. So 
state agencies are required to transfer their records to us, but local government agencies are not. They can elect to hold on to their records forever. So what we have will depend on whether a local government agency has decided to transfer their records to us. It could be that they're still held with the agency themselves and you can contact the agency for access. Um, there's also what we hold is kind of governed by retention periods. So like I was saying earlier, the retention schedules determine how long records are kept. So um, it could be that a certain type of record is still being required to be held by the agency. And so you'd have to contact the agency for the record. And of course, you know, despite everyone's best efforts, sometimes records are destroyed, even though they should have come to the, rec the archives either through national natural disaster or just misinformation. So, you know, sometimes, unfortunately, the records just never make their way to us. But yeah, just contact whatever branch you think um, might be able to help. And if, even if it's the wrong branch, we'll forward it to the right branch. We'll get you started in the right direction. Uh, we are dedicated to helping you find the information you need. Um, so, like any public service, we're always trying to promote our mission and um, really remind people of our importance and the importance of our mission, the importance of keeping these records public and preserved. Um, so, with that, we do ask for your help. Uh, the best way to keep our public records public is to use our state arc use the state archives, reach out to us. Um, we're always help, happy to help you find the information you need. We keep track of all the use, the reference use in our collection, and it helps prove that, yes, this is a service that people need and use. Uh, refer research, other researchers to us if you know somebody who's looking for certain information, and we, we can help them out. If you work for or are adjacent to state or local government agencies, bring this, bring it up. Be, be like, um, are we transferring our records to the, the archives? Are we in contact with the archives? Um, what's going on with that? Just bring awareness. A lot of times uh, people just aren't aware of, of uh, government responsibility for uh, keeping or transferring records. And it's just, um, it's good to get that message out there and just make sure public employees know that we exist and we will take the records. Um, also, keep an eye out if you encounter public records outside of public custody. So, we've had people transfer records to us that were in their dad's basement. Um, and it, records tend to show up in unexpected places sometimes. So. If there are any public records that are held outside public custody, um, yeah, let us know or let them know that, hey, maybe this should be held by the archives. And with that, I'm going to transfer the rest of the show to Jessica. Thank you, Emily. Thank you again to everyone for joining us this morning. Um, I'm Jessica Jones, the reference archivist here at the Puget Sound Regional Branch, and I recognize some of the names and faces here, and I see a lot of new ones as well. So thanks to all of you for joining us today. Um, I'm going to give a, sort of a brief overview of the branch and then go into a little bit more detail about what some of our higher use records um, are and the kinds of research that we have going on here as well. Um, I consider this somewhat of a snapshot, but I think it could give you a good sense of what um, the branch has and what we can offer to researchers. So, sorry, I'm having <laughs> one moment. There we go. Okay, so where we are, um, as Emily said, we are the branch on the campus of Bellevue College. We've been co-located here for over 20 years now um, in a, a building and a space that was um, designed and built with us in mind. Our holdings um, here in this facility occupy about 38,000 uh, cubic feet of records. Um, and it's also where we have our research room 
and uh, provide reference services. Hey, Jessica, I don't know if you have the presentation going, but I just see the, um, the non presentation form. So. Sorry oh, to okay. Uh, hold on just a moment. Let's. Get back to the beginning so you can see it, but it's just in the. Yeah, it's, the in, the, presentation it's not mode. in the presentation mode. Okay, sorry about that. It's showing it correctly on my screen. So let me. Try again. Is that still showing? That, that's that right. Good. Okay. Yep. And then I'm going to try that's okay. Sorry about that. Okay. So, um, is as far as who we are, um, here's our small, but mighty staff. Um, we have a pretty limited crew for the volume of acquisitions and. Um, records training, records management training and uh, reference services that we handle here. Um, it's very busy and dedicated group, and we're really lucky to have additional assistance from interns and volunteers. And um, I just wanted to point out some of you um, who are familiar with us might recognize one of the, the volunteer names here, Phil. Uh, Phil Stairs worked here at the branch for over 30 years and only recently retired. And she's now one of our regular weekly volunteers. And another longtime staff member approaching well deserved retirement is Mike Saunders, the Puget Sound Regional Archivist, after over 40 years with the agency. So let's get into what we have here. Um, as Emily mentioned, I think you've probably gotten a sense by now um, the our geographic scope. Um, King, Kitsap, Pierce County, the chronological scope. We have records starting with the territorial government era um, to uh, records that were created in 2020 um, that have been transferred here. And um, as for the format, the high use um, records um, that we mostly, that I've mostly used to fulfill requests um, are documents, photographs, microfiche and microfilm and volumes, very large, heavy volumes. <laughs> and other materials I've used in fulfilling requests include maps, visual materials like slides and oversized photographic prints and audio recordings. And then getting into who we're helping with the research, um, we have genealogists, historians, authors, filmmakers, um, the environmental consultants, um, Emily mentioned, builders and architects, real estate, legal professionals, um, as well as um, people who are still currently working at government agencies. Um, and then we just have the relentlessly curious among us. Um, this is by no means an exhaustive list, but it shows, I think, um, that we have a pretty wide variety of researchers with different goals in mind. Um, and this is probably also a good place to note that we hear from a variety of both experienced and um, less experienced researchers. Um, for many people that call us, it will be the first and last time um, and others are regular routine researchers who um, come to see us repeatedly for different projects or maybe that one lifelong pass passion project. Um, and with others that are new to archives or really anyone with a more complex request, we take time to ask questions and help narrow the scope if needed and determine what records we have that would be most responsive to their research. So, um, talking about some of those research requests and records, um, Emily showed you the um, some of the big bucket categories, uh, governance, property, vital, legal. So, I'll show you some examples of those um, kinds of records and the kinds of research projects that they're often used for. And I'll also point out a couple of recent research requests that um, use these kinds of records too. So here we can start with the records that are helpful with property research. And um, this is our most voluminous in terms of how many requests we receive. Um, what you see listed here, um, the property record cards and folios, recordings and decks, assessments, tack rolls, maps, plots and surveys. 
Um, it's just a sampling of the records that we have. And I think Emily also mentioned that the availability of any particular um, set of records and the, you know, the coverage where and what, you know, years it covers, it just really varies um, depending on what we've received and um, what we haven't. So, um, the, um, with those records in mind, um, we can look at the type of research and projects that they're used for. Um, I think our biggest group of, uh, for property records is people doing environmental um, consulting, um, site assessment for commercial development. They're often geologists or others with a background in environmental science, um, but they can be architects or builders or, or any, anyone really. Um, these people usually fall into the more experienced category. Um, for the most part, they know exactly what they need within the records. They're hunting down pretty precise pieces of information in the property records for their reporting process. And, um, they tend to use the property record cards and the folios almost almost exclusively. Um, and then homeowners are another common property research group. Some are mainly interested in purchasing a photograph, like the person that ordered a, a print from the, the property record card that you see here. Um, or get, lots of folks give those as, as gifts as well um, from, you know, friends, family, neighbors. Um, another category of property owner less interested in photos, but need the records for documentation purposes. Um, like when you have to deal with problems related to things like legal lot determination, grandfathering in property, non-conforming properties, neighbor disputes, things along that line. Um, and then I wanted to point out that the last two on this list, GIS mapping and appraisal, um, one of these is very a, a very common request and one is a little bit less common um but they are ones that we've received recently so um the person requesting the uh kitsap county deed from the 1940s with this map um just a this is just an excerpt uh section of the map they were um they work for utility district in Kitsap County and they were working on a mapping project and realized that they were unable to determine the precise location of a well site based on the records available to them. So they asked if we could send a copy, if we had, first of all, if we even had a copy and if we were able to send a copy of the deed um, that they knew would show this map. Um, and we had it and we were able to send scan and, and send it over. So they were able to continue on with their project. And then this more common request, um, the pre-1965 tax rolls for Pierce County. Um, these were transferred to us from the Pierce County Assessor's Office, and they're only held on microfilm. And this request came from a current employee of the Assessor's Office who routinely asks for this kind of thing um, as he works through projects. So, moving on to researching people, um, you can see that the vital records Emily mentioned are shown here. Um, the, you know, we receive many requests for copies of birth and death and marriage records and to a lesser extent, things like school and county census records. And then there's also the legal records, um, things like the, uh, naturalization, probate, divorce cases, other civil cases, and even property records, uh, can yield some ownership information. Although the ones that we tend to use the most, um, don't sh show very much in that area. Um, so now thinking about those kinds of records, we can see the types of projects that that might help with. Um, there are those, of course, interested in their own family history, using the records to fill in blanks or key information or whole life stories. <laughs> and of course, we always have to say there's a chance of a proverbial skeleton or two hanging out in the stack, so beware of that. Um, we also have historians and writers researching records um, for exhibits and books and articles, and even recently a documentary film producer um, who requested homicide case files for a film about police surveillance. And um, the examples of recent research requests here on the left is a map from one of the school census volumes we have for the Tacoma area. Um, this was then called the Lowell School or the Lowell District of Tacoma. And um, 
that one jumped out at me because I went to Lowell Elementary in kindergarten, <laughs> just just uh, just off the side of this map. And um, this was pulled for a researcher who was looking for info about his his family members from the early 1900s, I believe it was. And then um, in the middle is a page from a pretty lengthy probate case file for the estate of Lou Graham, who was a um, notorious madame in early Seattle. Um, I believe the person that requested that is a writer. And then um, on the right, we have a page from a transcript of a coroner's inquest proceeding uh, related to a murder outside a saloon in 1905. Um, I think it was by a timber camp, if I remember right. Um, one of our regular researchers is using information from that uh, for his work at the East Side Heritage Society. And I'd like to, to pause here and say there's another group requesting vital records that I would characterize as just sort of average members of the public. Um, they're not really researching in the way we've been talking about here so far and the way we might be used to thinking about that word, um, but they need copies of records for personal business. So the property owners managing issues certainly fall into that category, as would someone asking for vital records for a driver's license or a lost mirror certificate, things like that. And um, although motivation is not really relevant to our role as public servants and preserving and providing access to these records, I think it's helpful to keep in mind where these requesters are sort of situated when they're coming to us. Um, and for instance, those who are in need of vital records um, to manage the process of settling estates for family members or securing social security benefits after a spouse passes away, um, it's a pretty common request. Um, and, you know, those people are coming to us in a pretty in a recent, you know, with recent loss and what is it a very extraordinarily difficult time in their lives. So I think it's our responsibility and I feel like it's my privilege to be able to help them make that a little bit easier. And then I just thought I would show you um, a little bit uh, to, to wrap up sort of about the records and the research. Um, we're looking at some recent, you know, they recent research projects here that all happen to be agency requests and um, the agency transferred the records to us and then they need to have copies for various reasons um, similar to the assessor's office needing that tax roll from microfilm um, we call the of course these are governance related um, like the document on the far right it's a 1910 ordinance and council bill you can see outside with the stamps and the signatures the city of seattle has scans of these records and transferred um, them to us as security backup, if I remember properly. Um, so they do occasionally ask us to scan and send something. This one, they actually needed um, the entire um, outside scanned because they believe that there might've been notations um, and um, it, it, that document folds open to a, a full size um, set of pages. So uh, the document in the middle is a similar request, pretty common one. Um, the city of shoreline clerk's office needed a copy of the minutes from a particular city council meeting sent over to them and then on the left we have an actual picture of a researcher <laughs> in the research room uh, this is a longtime port of tacoma person who has actually been in a couple times recently the ports transferred records here and he was looking for a very particular image that he remembered actually taking the photograph at an event like 30 years ago or so. And um, he came into the research room and looked through what he thought it would be in and he couldn't find it. We were able to track it down and um, it was in a slide collection. So here he is with, um, you can see our branch archivist Midori <laughs> helping him there with on the left. And um, he ended up finding the exact image that he was looking for. So that is um, sort of the overview, and um, if you're ready to start your own research, um, you can see the collections listing on our website. Emily um, provided, showed you a little bit about the digital archives. We do have a catalog. Um, make sure to limit your search to the Puget Sound branch um, if you're looking for records that are held only at our location. Um, and of course, we're always happy to help, you know, provide direction and guidance on sort of where to start within the, the catalogs um, and the, the online resources. Um, you can call, email, or submit a question through our website when you're ready to start. Um, we can often respond to requests remotely 
but there is a queue um, and we fulfill them first come first serve. So um, if you would like to see them in person, you can schedule an appointment here in our research room. And um, we do need a little bit of advance notice before your visit. Um, and then I think Emily may have mentioned this too, but when sending an email or leaving a, a message or anything, the more information, the better um, names and dates, locations, um, just the more that you can give us the better um, to figure out what you might need. Um, there's no charge to place a research request um, um, up to, um, I think it's 50 pages of you know, photocopies or PDF scans um, is no charge. Um, if a particular request is bigger or um, it might take more research time um, that might incur fees, we would let you know before proceeding. And then a quick word, of course, on researching here in general, all those old library rules apply. Um, we do allow you to take photographs of the records in most cases. Um, we will let you know if there's anything that you're seeing that may have um, a copyright concern, but for the most part, um, most of the records in our, in our high use requests are public. Um, we can also, as I said, photocopy or make scans for you. Um, we'll bring out the records for you, provide some orientation. Um, ask that you be gentle, of course, with records and, um, you may need to wear gloves if you need to protect the older, more fragile records. Um, and then, of course, there are times when we don't have what you're looking for, um, but we don't, we don't want you to go away feeling like you haven't been helped in some way. Um, even if we weren't able to locate exactly what you need, uh, we can give you referrals to other agencies and um, archives that might be able to assist you and share research guides and ideas for sort of next steps. So, that is all I have for you today. Thank you so much for joining us and showing you that we're still here and ready to help at the Puget Sound branch. Thanks, Jessica. So um, I'm gonna go over some questions that we received in the chat. If you have any questions, feel free to enter them in or um, email us if, as you think of them. Um, so, Phil asked, I have an interest in voter registration records up through the 1930s. Could you address the issue of accessing these records? And Jessica, I don't know if you've dealt with um, these yet, but ones we hold at our branch. Um, I, they are, voter registration records are considered restricted. And I don't know if uh, maybe you could flag down Phil for how we deal with that. I know with the restricted records I've dealt with in the past, it might be that we can, if you give us a name, we can search and see if it's there. Um, and with other, for like, if a scholar is interested in looking at voter registration records or, or a restricted record series in the past, we have allowed them access with the caveat that they can't take any images of the record and they use it in an anonymous way for scholarly purposes. Um, and I'm sure if you have any questions, uh, specifically about the voter registration, we can, um, you can email us and we can go over exactly how those records are accessed. Cause I personally don't have a lot of experience with those, but. I'm sure Midori does our, our I, other I was, reference. Yeah, I was just, sorry. I was going to add Midori just popped in and, and said they are restricted, um, by law, I think. I believe what she was saying is that it's you, we can view them, but, um, not copy them. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not 100 percent on that though. So we can, um, follow up to let you know for sure. All right. So my, kind of my, 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 uh, may, may I jump in here since sure. I asked the question? Sure. Yeah, I've talked with uh, Midori and Phil about this topic before the pandemic began. And my question is mostly directed towards. Uh, the inconsistencies between state law, which says that voter registration records are open and available and for use for political purposes. Okay. Uh, and the election laws of the state of Washington and how that openness uh, is not finding its way into the archives world. Uh, and Midori and Phil says that maybe there might need to be a change in state law. 
I, you know, I don't know that that's correct or not, but I'm not going to dispute it. I would like to know how we can open the historical voter registration list for use as an historical uh, archive serving historical research purposes. Uh, going back to say to 1930, makes anybody who's covered in those re voter registration records, as an example, older than 18 years old. There is a little provision in the Washington State Election Laws that says that anybody under the age of 18 until they're 18, their voter registration information is not to be disclosed. So how can we administratively at least begin to work our way through a broader based accessibility of these records? Well, so, oh, sorry, go ahead, Emily. <laughs> Oh, no, I was, I'm just looking at the RCW's we site in our catalog. Um, I think the main one that is causing us to have some pause about making these records uh, public is RCW 40.24.060, where it says the county auditor um, shall mail ballots. Neither the name nor the address of a program app participant shall be included in any list of registered voters available to the public. So it sounds like there might be some conflicting um, information in the law. Right. Well, and... that provision of the law deals with uh, the security of, say, domestic violence victims. And that law was enacted in 1991, where the program was created. So by definition, any voter registration uh, record prior to 1991, 1991, when the pro program did not even exist, is open and accessible. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, it sounds like Jessica might have been talking to Midori about this uh, as we're going on. But yeah, it definitely sounds like something that. Uh, we should be looking into you and having a clear policy on, but your question does uh, bring up a good point about the kinds of records that we have that, like I said, 99% of our records are considered open and accessible to the public, but there are these like tricky issues where we're kind of having to balance privacy and access. And um, Jessica, I don't know if you had anything. I was just. Add. Yes, I just had uh, me, Dory, and Mike were just sort of providing their um, their f info on this, and um, it sounds like, and you may have already said some of this, I missed some of what you said, but just that um, sort of the bottom line is that by statute, the voter, you know, original voter registration records are closed, um, and that we are beholden to, you know, follow that um, law. Um, as far as the question of how do we change that, and how do we, you know, get the records more open and accessible, um, convincing the legislature <laughs> to change the state law seems to be the answer. So. So, yeah, and I'm sure that, you know, like all legislation, it's like up to interpretation and further clarification, um, but kind of along and thanks Phil for that discussion, um, we're just going to move on to kind of an adjacent question that we had in the chat about um, Western State Hospital or other state hospital patient records. Um, so, again, these are uh, records uh, that are considered restricted. Um, we don't hold the actual patient treatment records themselves, but we do hold uh, registers of patients um, for, I think ending in a, the 50s or 60s getting um, starting from the 1800s when the state hospitals were formed so in that case um, what if you suspect that somebody was a patient there you can forward us their identifying information um, and we can look in the registers, see if we can find a, a record that they were a patient. And if once we give you that information, you can contact the Department of Social and Health Services and see if they still hold the patient records because the Social and Health Services does still hold a lot of those patient treatment records. And if you can prove that you're 
a family member, they probably will release them to you. Um, yeah, census again, it's kind of this tricky area where census records are considered public accessible after 70 years, but the voter records aren't. So as there's all these loopholes and hoops to jump through and providing access to records, we're just working through it. Um, how did you get your archivist training and what was the learning curve learning the varieties of records? Um, so I can just speak for me. I got a master's in archives and records management from Western Washington University. Um, and then the learning curve for me, I started at the state branch in Olympia. It was very steep. Um, the archival education does not um, prepare you exactly for how to answer research requests. It's kind of a broad theoretical overview. So actually in the weeds, getting in the weeds, uh, figuring out how to use the collections and provide people the information what they need is a very steep learning curve. Um, but yeah, it's also very interesting, exciting. And Jessica, do you want to go over? Yeah. Um, so I was, um, my master's degree was the library and information science program at the University of Washington and um, they did not have an archive specialty. So I, through internships and lots of networking and projects, um, I was able to sort of tailor my own um, experience towards more of an archives and special collections um, focus. And um, very, I am still in the very steep <laughs> learning curve stage. I started here about three months ago, so I am still just every single day taking in more information and, and figuring out what we have and how we can use it and um, all that goes into that. And like Emily said, it it's coming, you come to any, especially new archives, that's, you know, a new type of archives new to you with a very generalist sort of um, uh, outlook and I suppose I, I think, I think of it as, you know, I may not know everything. I definitely do not know everything, but I'm getting a very good idea of where to find it. <laughs> so, yes, that is the key. It's like, we don't know every, like, we do not know everything, but it's learning about how to act, find the things that you can get you further. Um, again, Stephanie asked about the, going back to the patient records, um, what I need to do that in person. So in that case, no, um, likely you can just send an email with what you're looking for and then we'll get back to you if we find anything. A lot of times if you, if your question is something discreet and um, like a discreet question with specific information that you're looking for, like I am looking for the marriage between person A and person B in this time period in this location. We can look it up for you. Um, it's when your research is more broad, like I am looking for the history of fishing policies from A to B. That's when we're going to be like, okay, this is a very broad topic and likely you want to be looking through the record yourself um, to be doing that research. So we can provide you with uh, kind of guides to records we have that go over that topic and then you can schedule an appointment to research. Um, it's kind of the same thing with um, kind of more in-depth property research. Um, like if you're looking for, I, I wanna know if the assessor captured a photo of my house, we can look up and this is the parcel number, or the address and the parcel number, we'll look up and see what we have for that. But if you're wanting to do like in-depth research of the history of how your property was valued over time, um, we would ask you to come in and do the appointment in person. Um, so for back to the patient hospital or the state hospital, you would submit a public records request with Department of Social and Health Services. And then I think in what I've heard from researchers in the past that they will send you copies that, um, I don't believe they would require you to come in person to do that, but yeah, you would send a public records request to their public records officer. And that's the, the, you do not need, I don't know if you are familiar with public records requests, but it's how citizens can um, 
request active records from government agencies. That, so records that are still in the government's possession or the agency's possession. So public records request is how you access records that way, but you do not need to submit a public rec records request to us because um, our records are considered just automatically public for the most part. So just submitting a research request is enough. All right, um, feel free to, we have a couple more minutes. Um, feel free to answer, uh, enter in any further questions. I just wanted to also let you know, if you haven't checked out um, our State Archives YouTube page, we've uploaded a video on this week's uh, haunted archives. So in the past, we've done a haunted archives tour where you can come to the archives in person and take a spooky tour with um, people from our staff acting out uh, stories of records that we actually have in our collections. Um, this year, we just did a recording of those stories. So I think our, my coworkers did a great job acting out the little stories of people that who actually we have records about in our collections. So check that out. Um, and yeah, feel free to send us any questions. I believe if you still have the, um, email I forward you, you can reply to that. Or if you want to just send us the email to our branch, um, PG, uh, PS branch archives at sos.wa.gov. And thank you everybody for participating today. Thank you all.